Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Mairead. Nice to see everybody coming in. Welcome, Ty and Sinead. Excellent. Welcome, welcome, Robert, Ellen, Dorte. Welcome, David. Okay, Hala. Okay, thank you. Opening. Yeah. Thank you. So welcome everyone to Conversations on COVID-19 webinar series. I'm Hala Ali, the coordinator of Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships. These webinars take place every Friday at 12 p.m. GMT, and every week we host experts from healthcare and global health fields to discuss various aspects of COVID-19 pandemic. This webinar is the 11th in the series, and today's topic is uh, the broader health and health systems impacts of COVID-19 in lower and middle income countries. It's our pleasure to co-organize this webinar with the Health Service Executive. The HSC is the responsible for the provision of health and personal social services for everyone living in Ireland. And we will learn more about uh, the HSC Global Health Program from David Wickliam later. A recording of this webinar will be available in our websites and also YouTube channels shown on the screen. Irish Global Health Network and Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships. Live streaming is also available right now on our YouTube channel, Irish Global Health Network. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the questions and answer feature in the bottom of the screen. For now, I will leave you with my co-host Nadine Pers france the Executive Director of Irish Global Health Network, and she will introduce the speakers and lead the panel discussion. Nadine. Wonderful, Hala. So welcome, everybody. Happy Friday. Here we are again, um, this time with, um, again, a, a fab fabulous array of speakers. Uh, today, we are joined by Dr. David Weekliam, who many of you will know. He's the Global Health Programme Director for the HSC, um, has his fingers in many pies, Is also represents Ireland on the board of the Esther Alliance for Global Health Partnerships. So delighted to, to have David with us today. Um, we will have uh, Dr. Elenia Makamo Amado. She is the Deputy Director for Medical Services uh, from, for Mozambique for the Ministry of Health. We had her a minute ago. She'll be coming back on um, to join us just for a brief, just as briefly as she can, because they're in they're in the middle of, of something right now in the ministry. Um, Elenia is a friend of a very good friend of Ireland, an obstetrician by uh, by trade, and she's responsible for hospital services um, throughout the country in Mozambique. Um, we also are really honoured to have Dr. Luchika Dichu. She's the Executive Secretary for the Stop TB Partnership. Luchika has led the Stop TB Partnership for the last nine years. She's a public health expert and a physician, and she has devoted her whole career mm -hmm. to helping and supporting people affected by, uh, by TB, especially vulnerable communities. So welcome, Luchika, to Ireland. And of of course, we have, uh, last but not least, uh, Dr. Trish Scanlon. She's a pediatric oncologist um, working and living in Muhambili Hospital in Tanzania. She has been developing the National Cancer uh, Children's Cancer Service for Muhambili Hospital uh, since 2007. And she has also founded uh, an NGO called Their Lives Matters and also um, been, been the, the key focal point between for the partnership between Muhambili Hospital and, and Crumlin's Children Hospital here in Ireland. Uh, so welcome, Trish. And lastly, and not leastly, we have uh, Dr. Professor Rory Brewer, who is the former head of epidemiology and public mm -hmm. health. Um, and we would love to start, as we do every week, um, with an overview from you, Rory. So thank you for that. Great. Uh, thank you, Nadine. You can hear me OK? Uh, I'm just going into a uh, slideshow. Um, did I share my screen there? Not yet, Roy. Uh, let's just another go at it. Share screen. Okay. And uh, is that sharing yet? Um, not, not yet. So it might be an idea, Ellen, if you want to yeah. pull up those slides. I'll share that now. Thank you. Great, Ellen. So we can um, we go straight into the second slide. And you'll be familiar with it when you when we get into it there. Uh, we're going second. It's the just it's a list of countries from the we need to enable editing there, is it? It's a list of countries from the Worldometer. Are you getting in, Ellen? Yeah, that's the second slide there. So I can go to the Worldometer if you'd like. Okay, sorry, it's just I'm not 
seeing it, I need to get out, yeah. Great, second slide. Yep, there you go. Sorry, I'm actually um, seeing the wrong thing, so let me get out of it. We're all seeing the wrong thing. Yeah, Ellen. Um, Thank you for bearing with us. There we have it now. So just while it's coming up, the um, the second slide has to be, because we said we're focusing on uh, low and middle income countries, I just put Brazil and uh, India up at the top. We can't quite see them yet. Um, but most of the focus is going to be on, uh, on uh, sub-Saharan Africa. I'm going to come back. There are issues around Brazil and India, which are actually very similar to issues uh, in Africa. Um, but we see uh, the first there, South Africa, and Ghana is the sixth. Uh, and they are both high uh, reporting countries when it comes to both cases and for tests. And then S Sudan, which comes uh, eighth, um, it, it, doing very few tests, but actually reporting a lot of cases. So on this slide and the next, I think the, the main point you want to make is that uh, in, in, in Africa, where it, 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 there is a much lower um, testing capacity, we can go into the next slide now and just see some of the countries that, uh, particularly ones with the, we have people in the panel uh, from uh, reporting on Tanzania and Mozambique. And uh, what we should be doing is reporting both uh, cases that are confirmed by testing and syndromic cases or probable cases uh, and, and then reporting the totals. So Sudan, for instance, has only, um, I think, uh, a, very, a very small amount of testing going on there. Um, four, 400 tests, but uh, actually had over 4,000 uh, cases reported. So that's just the main point on that. Uh, let's not rely on um, viral testing in Africa. And let's move on to the next one. So there's a lot in this slide. Uh, and finally, we're getting modeling data uh, from Africa. We're not getting, we're not in a position to, to really analyze a large amount of actual data. But uh, previously, we, we, we reported the WHO Afro paper. Um, and that one it was, is very useful because it not only gives estimates of deaths, but it gives these estimates of infections and whether they're mild, moderate, severe, critical, and it gives uh, numbers of admissions. And it does it by country, which gives countries some handle of what to be expecting over the next six months. Previously, we had uh, estimates from Imperial College in London models. And we see on the right hand side there, radically different estimates of uh, deaths. The imperial uh, estimates are anything from 10 to 75 times higher than the WHO ones. Um, South Africa, I've just sort of give three asterisks there at the top because we have a quite reliable, a good key informant interview who, who has informed us that uh, the modelers in South Africa are actually estimating in the region of 40 to 50,000 deaths by November. So that comes somewhere in between the WHO and the Imperial estimate. So let's not pay, let's not uh, you know, put too much reliance on estimates and, and the Imperial ones just look uh, outrageously high. Um, there's another paper just come out from um, Africa now and that's uh, looking at three countries, uh, Senegal, Ghana and Kenya. And it's coming up with very quite similar uh, estimates of, of the burden of a, a disease is likely to hit uh, the health services. So that's a, a useful one. And let's move on to the next one now. So here, uh, I'm gonna spend a little time on this slide because this sort of pulls together the knowledge that we, we have, uh, which is emerging from Africa. Slower transmission rates uh, and, and lower risks of infection. And it looks like a lower reproduction rate and two pr primary reasons for this is Africa's younger population and more rural population. But urban, concentrated urban areas are at risk. Uh, a high proportion likely to be asymptomatic. So the, the infections will be occurring at high levels, 
but but much lower uh, symptomatic uh, rates than in Europe and North America, and different vulnerabilities. So where, while there'll be far fewer deaths in Africa, we will see them in younger adults because of comorbidities, often hidden ones, as in Europe and America, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but also TB, HIV, anemia. Mortality may not be measured in Africa to the same extent, but that's not uh, unique to Africa. We can see uh, huge levels of underreporting in places like Brazil uh, and issues of uh, maybe lack of openness of governments. Africa has some advantages, including being able to fall back on the experiences from Ebola and other communicable diseases. WHO Afro has uh, emphasized the importance of protecting uh, the resilience of health systems. But the theme of today really is that we should be looking at other health priorities which may suffer uh, and, and cause morbidity and mortality as a result of COVID, greater than COVID will, will, will cover it, will cause itself. And we need to look more broadly than at the narrow view of health. So next slide. So here we, we uh, I'm, I'm really showing this slide from Imperial just to, to show two things. Unfortunately, I, I can't show them, but uh, those two high peaks there. The first peak is if we do nothing, but the second peak, the high peak, is if, if African countries lock down and then release again. And it means that we're, we could be seeing, uh, you know, a, 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 through an inability to come up with a strategy after two months of lockdown. And, and this is uh, a question that's uh, facing South Africa now. What do you do if you've locked down for two months? Um, lockdown is, is questionable, but let's move on and see some of the, um, so what are the appropriate responses? Now, this is some areas we've covered before, and I must say I'm moving more towards the community and the community health worker based approach. Um, uh, as I said, moving towards syndromic diagnosis, don't invest in PCR testing kits, Certainly, if you've got a resource poor and a staff poor country, uh, physical distancing needs to be done in a humane way and appropriate to the setting. Um, hygiene and uh, hygiene we've talked about before. Communication and engaging with communities. Africa could well do this a lot better than many, um, for instance, uh, Latin American countries. Cash transfer and, and food security and health systems responses. But let's move on. And let's look at some of the uh, specific. Um, so I, I focused here on COVID 19s impact on mother and child health. Uh, and those arrows there point to the sorts of impacts that will occur the workforce, the supplies, demand reduction through uh, financial impact on people, and fear of going to the health services, uh, access reduction through lockdown. There's a list down on the left-hand column there of some of the services impacted. And, and those are uh, estimates of the impacts on the right. Let's move to the next slide and look at some of the specific uh, impacts. Um, and I'm focusing on mother and child health more than anything else here. And uh, uh, up to 60% of avoidable deaths could be avoided in women in childbirth if we ensure the provision of uh, uterotonics, oxytocin in childbirth, antibiotics, anticonvulsants, and clean birth environments. And below there, we can protect children and avoid up to 60% of additional deaths if we can ensure uh, their nutrition. And then you can see those three areas for um, investing in prioritizing these services for children. Let's move on. So HIV, TB, malaria, we mentioned it before. Um, uh, Dr. Luchika will speak to TB, uh, but, but it's uh, ARV uh, interruption, bed net campaigns. Um, and we shoot through the next few, few slides, uh, Ellen, we won't spend time on them. Uh, the effect on HIV will be felt over a period of a couple of years. Malaria, if the bed nets don't get distributed, the effects will be seen over the next year and TB will be talking to, and that will be a more extended impact, interrupting diagnosis and treatment programs resulting in mortality. Next slide. We've shown this before, and I think we may come back to it. Uh, very early, one of WHO's best publications for LMICs 
how to focus on essential health services, what to do. Next slide. Uh, uh, and I think this may well be the final slide. Where should governments and donors focus? And I think this is sort of an issue for discussion uh, by the panel today. And I've moved much more towards don't focus on the direct in impacts of COVID so much as those indirect impacts. And then the final slide, I think, is just a series of uh, reports. And you'll have those. Ellen will put those up there so you'll be able to draw on them. So thank you, Nadine. Uh, thank you, Rory. Um, yeah, some really, uh, really interesting points there as we kind of look into the, in the data and thank you for all of your work to uh, to bring that to us. Um, I'd like to go over actually to uh, Dr. Elenia in Mozambique. Dr. Elenia, have you been able to join us? If you can put your video on, we should be able to, uh, we should be able to see you. Yes, wonderful. How are you? Good afternoon, Nadine, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you once again for this opportunity to join Mozambique because since March uh, 22, we make part of the world statistic because now we are having COVID in Mozambique. So I'm okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. I would like to present my colleague uh, Benigna. She's also with me, but maybe she can present herself, herself later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eleni, and we really appreciate it. And maybe we could just start by asking you, could you tell us a little bit about the impact of COVID, the impact that it's having on the regular health services and the health system in Mozambique at the moment? Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Mozambique, since <clears throat> the pandemic have uh, uh, been diagnosed, we have tried to prepare ourselves just to provide this health care because we knew that as the pandemic has arrived in Mozambique, we have to be prepared to provide health care during the pandemic. So we decide some rules and some uh, guidelines just to provide this health care. We didn't um, uh, forbid the persons to come to the hospital, but we made some uh, rules just to provide all the, 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 the service that we have to do on the health facility. I'm talking for, uh, about the health facilities in the peripheral area where we provide the antenatal care, we provide the treatment of TB, the treatment of the malaria, the treatment of the HIV. As we know, we have a, a prevalence of 13.2%, so we have a high prevalence. So in the big hospitals, we also decide to uh, not to close, but to emphasize the treatment of the chronic disease, such also the hypertension, the diabetes. Um, we had also <clears throat> the, the cancer. So all these patients have to come to the hospital and we provide the, the, the health care. Of course, uh, we, 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 we we, we saw that in the beginning, in the March, when we start having the, this case of COVID in us, we have a little bit reduced of the patients in incoming of the hospital. So this was the first impact that we saw that the, the, the persons or the patients are afraid to go to the hospital because they were thinking in the way going to the hospital, even the hospital, they can uh, have this uh, infection of coronavirus. Wow, and, and Dr. Elania, I mean, thank you for painting a picture of, of just, you know, what's happening in the hospitals. And, you know, having looked at the some of the data that Rory was showing us around um, modeling, have you at this point, are you able to see any trends in that suggest, you know, an increased incidence of certain diseases or fatalities due to the indirect effects of COVID? Uh, Actually, I can say that we are having trends, but we have seen some cases and we are making the analysis of the data that we have. But exactly, uh, we can say that the chronic disease like hypertension, diabetes, most of these patients uh, being afraid to go to the hospital, we received some which were discompensated because they finished the medication, they were afraid to go to the hospital and we received them in the emergency service. So this is the, I think the trend is that we have, but we need more time to make the analysis in the other hospital that we have received. I'm talking about the main hospitals, but we are receiving also the data of the other hospitals. 
And and what about in terms of challenges? Um, and I know that um, that that the ministry there has been working with the HSC for for the for a number of years, um, just in in terms of strengthening the health system. But what do you see are the main challenges for the health system, particularly as COVID and the implications start to be seen? Okay, uh, Nadine, we have gains. We have a lot of gains. You know that we have the challenges of the mortality, mother mortality, the child mortality. We have a high prevalence of HIV and the TB. Malaria is also a burden in here in Mozambique. So this is a big challenge that we have to face. We have to have to still having this reduction of the maternal deaths. We have to keep reducing this maternal child and neonatal deaths. So to reduce this maternal and neonatal and keep the patients with HIV, keep doing the treatment, even the TB going to have facilities to have these medicines to keep treatment of the TB, it's a big challenge of the system. But we believe with the advocacy, the way we are being doing with the communities, working with the uh, the community, the leaders, leaders, some additional leaders, we believe that we are going to maybe not to reduce this body, but I think we are going to maintain this gain. We know that it's going to be difficult, but we have to look fighting with against this. Wow. And Dr. Elenia, just one last question, because I know I'm not going to be able to come back around to you. Um, do you have any advice or any words of wisdom for others who are in other countries listening to this, who are thinking about how to keep health systems as strong as possible? Any advice or wisdom from Mozambique to share? Uh, I would like to thank this platform. I'm sharing with Ireland. We also, we are working with uh, Portugal. We have a webinar where we share uh, these protocols. We, we, we share some, some uh, challenges that we have to face, but also we work with the WHO at the moment. Um, Dr. Alania, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. And we know that you need to go now and you're, you're literally in the middle of dealing with some of the issues around COVID in the ministry. So thank you so much for taking the time and we will feed this back to you um, when, when we've completed. Thank you so much, Dr. Alania. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you and have a nice webinar for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we will move from uh, Mozambique um, back to Ireland, if we can, and um, maybe over to you, David, to say, I mean, obviously, you've been working in the HSC with Mozambique, with the ministry there for, for some time, but I wonder why, could you tell us, I, I know you're very passionate about this particular topic of strengthening health systems and the broader impacts of COVID. Why is this topic so important? And what are your concerns about the broader impact of health on maintaining a sense services, both in Ireland and also maybe you could comment on, on your work with uh, low middle income countries. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Nadine. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. And I'd like to say the HSC is really pleased to be able to co-host this webinar. And also to say we appreciate very much the collaboration with everyone with these weekly webinars, which we're finding really excellent. I mean, from our point of view, I, I think I mean, I see this important on, on two fronts. It's important for us as an issue in Ireland, as it is also important for our partners with in low and middle income countries. And I think over the, the last few weeks, this issue of the indirect effects of COVID-19 has come more into focus. And there's been some very stark reports that have come out with a lot of concerns about these impacts and, and Ruri has, has nicely kind of shared on some of those. So what, what I'd like to do is maybe just share a little bit about from perspective in Ireland, and it's very interesting to hear Elenia's perspective from Mozambique, I think some very similar issues, and then maybe come back to the focus, which is on, on low and middle income countries. So what we experienced in Ireland, we had our, our first case reported by WHO of COVID-19 on the 1st of March. And interestingly, on that day, only two other two countries in Europe had reported any deaths from COVID-19 at that time. And then just 10 days later, we had Italy with over 600 deaths. 10 days later, it was over 4,000. And by then Spain, which had no cases at the beginning of March, had over 1,000 cases. So we were watching this unfolding on our TV screens. We were seeing the, the impact of this with how hospitals were getting overwhelmed, how communities were being impacted. And thinking about, well, maybe this can happen here in Ireland and the need for us to be, to be prepared. 
and concerns we had here about our own capacity and recognizing that we had maybe less capacity with intensive care beds, for instance, in other countries. And we responded very quickly and I think very strongly. And that, of course, meant putting a lot of focus on COVID-19 and having to suspend some non-essential services. And thankfully, that response has been very effective. And now the, the epidemic is coming under control. But what we saw then over a number of weeks was the effect on health services generally. And what we were seeing was that not just non-essential services were being affected, but people weren't coming for essential services. And we were, people were starting to report on this. So we had the Irish Patients Association, for instance, telling us that there were 30% less patients attending emergency departments or 24% less admissions. GPs were reporting that there were less people coming for monitoring, important monitoring for chronic diseases. We had the cancer control programs reporting about people being afraid to come for chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So there were concerns why, why, why services and essential services were being affected. People perhaps being afraid to come out of fears of COVID-19. Maybe people reluctant to travel because of travel restrictions. And then maybe people feeling that the health staff were too busy with COVID-19 and that the services weren't available. And of course, we know that, that there were pressures because staff, some staff were affected by having to isolate as, if, as cases or contacts with COVID-19. So this issue is very much now in focus in Ireland. I think our, our last week, I just heard our, our Prime Minister, Tisha Gliavaratkar, talking about this and saying how important it is to get essential services back to save lives and talking about the, the secondary deaths, such as from cancer, that can occur due to what we do for COVID-19. And our own CEO, Paul Reid, the head of our health service, also emphasizing the challenge that this is going to present because this won't be about delivering services as usual as we have before, because we're going to have to pay extra attention to ensure the safety of our staff and, and, and patients. So that's a challenge we have in Ireland. And, and then we'll look at the low and middle income countries. And I can see how this presents maybe an even greater challenge with the, the effects that the indirect effects of, of COVID-19. And just to, to move on to that, I mean, Rory has spoken about it very well. And I think he's, he's highlighted some of the, the impacts on, on different diseases. So I, I don't need to repeat that, but I'm also reading lots of these reports that are showing the impact. One from last week from WHO, UNICEF and Gavi, so talking about how in 68 countries, routine immunization services are disrupted and there's 100 million ch children at risk from vaccine preventable diseases. We're hearing this from our partners on the ground in different countries. Ethiopia, I was hearing about some of the reductions in services, people attending for antenatal care and other essential services. It's, uh, TB, when I mean, we're going to hear more about TB, but the TB report that Ruri referred to is very stark and talking about the number, the potential number of additional cases and deaths as a result of disruption to services. So these are very severe and real impacts that, that are being faced. So to maybe say a few things about maybe how to respond to this, uh, I think from, I would say the first thing is, is really to make this a priority. And I mean, Rory has shown the, some of the epidemiology and what we're seeing is that the, the pattern of the spread of COVID-19 is, is not as much as we anticipated at this point in, in, low, in low and middle income countries. We're seeing less cases and less deaths. And I saw just in on the WHO report, Yesterday, only 62 deaths reported across all of Africa. So the modeling and the experience so far is different than, than we expected. And there is a danger then, perhaps that if countries focus too much on the COVID-19 response, that there will be what some people are calling collateral damage from effects on, on, on other diseases. So this has implications at lots of levels, clearly for the broader public health measures, restrictions, lockdowns, that sort of thing. I'm not going to comment more on that because I, I really want to just say maybe a few points about how we need to respond in terms of maintaining essential services because I think this is, is critical at this time. And the first point really to say is, is the importance of good planning and a good planning and preparation. Uh, we heard that from Elenia about how the attention they're giving to, to preparation. And Ruri in his presentation spoke about the WHO guidelines, the operational guidance for maintaining essential health services in the context of COVID-19. I mean, that is an excellent guidance 
it's very succinct, it's very practical. And I would say that's the place to start in terms of, of planning for ma maintaining essential services. And it, it, it talks about how to do that, but it gives a lot of uh, focus around governance and, and coordination and so on. It also uh, directs people to think about a health systems approach, the importance of focusing on maintaining the health workforce, also the, the importance of maintaining availability of, of medicines, equipment, other essential supplies. We also need to think about how to deliver services in the context of, of COVID-19. They're going to have to be delivered differently. And so with how do you deliver those services while also maintaining social distancing, meticulous attention to hand hygiene and infection control and, and so on. When one thing I'd, I'd like to say is I think this, there's an opportunity here as well as the, the, the challenge that's being faced, the, the opportunity to think differently about the way we deliver healthcare. We're being forced to do it differently. Can we use the opportunity to provide healthcare better? We're all trying to achieve universal health coverage, leaving no one behind, provide more equitable healthcare. Maybe there's an opportunity to think how we're doing it, if we're doing it differently, how can we be better in that regard. And I think this will inevitably lead us to thinking more about community engagement. And Ruri spoke about that. And I think Elenia also referred to that to have more engagement of communities in the health system. Uh, I'd like to mention about just protecting health workers. I think this maybe never doesn't get always enough attention that health workers need to be protected to be safe from infection, but also they need to be looked after and we need to ensure that they they feel supported, that they have psychosocial supports, they feel cared for and are able to, to continue to work. I think it's very important to give attention to that in, in a time like this. And just the last thing then I'd like to say is that, I mean, our work with countries in, in Africa, it's through North-South, it's through institutional partnerships, health partnerships. And I think there is a lot of opportunity and scope through these relationships we have between our countries to support our partners in maintaining essential services while they're going through the challenge of dealing with COVID-19. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it there, Nadine, and um, I'm very interested to hear other people's perspectives. Thank you, David. Um, really very, very interesting. And um, I think just to say, just coming in from, um, from some of our attendees, I think Brida has just mentioned there around, um, you know, can we, can we use midwives better? Midwives who, are, who have been trained or have retired, can we start thinking of them more in terms of um, being able to support? And just another point coming in from uh, Georgina Caswell from Global Network of People Living with HIV in South Africa, um, where she's listening from today, the lockdown has been so hard on our lives. The poorest, most vulnerable have not had salaries because their employers have not had any income. It's tough. How do you pay for rent and buy food? Many have gotten in debt. Health is our last priority when there is no work, no money, no food. And when everyone is feeling so stressed, you know, she says, glad we're easing up next week, but scared that we haven't reached our peak yet. So I think just the realities of all the different countries and particularly, as Rory mentioned, lockdown and, and you know, the, the context of lockdown across different countries. And um, so I think I'll move if I can to uh, Dr. Luchika. Um, and uh, Dr. Lijika, thank you for joining us. Um, I know your, your modeling report has already been referred to a number of times, but it really caught our attention when we saw the figures in the modeling report produced by the Stop TB partnership, and um, particularly around the negative effects that COVID is having or could, can have or will have on TB. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And if you can draw on some countries from low middle income countries, just so we can focus some examples from there. Thank you. Yes, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. And I think uh, this is obviously first time, but I really uh, like the spirit, the idea. So congratulations, uh, you know, it's not a time for congratulations, but actually it's very good to have these platforms and sharing information, so well done. I also want to say that uh, it's rarely where you are in a meeting for the first time without knowing too much uh, of the colleagues, uh, but agreeing completely with all the things that were said. And, you know, when David was speaking, I was like, what I'm, you know, it's like, I don't need to speak because most of the things and the spirit of it, he really reflected very well. So, um, you know, just uh, uh, we uh, commissioned this study uh, and it's based on modeling and I have things to say there as well because a lot of things are estimates and, you know, a lot of the, uh, there are a lot of variables that are put in, uh, in any model that is constructed. 
But I wanted to say that it started actually, uh, you know, when uh, we in January we were a lot in touch. Uh, we were in touch with our colleagues in China, uh, dealing with TB because, as you know, TB is, uh, is a high burden. Uh, China is a high burden country for TB and MDR TB uh, in the top five. So uh, we wanted to see what's going on. So we were in touch. We were calling them weekly, and invariable uh, during January and the a big part of February was like. Listen, we don't have time for TB. The situation is here. Forget about all your little discussions about TB and MDR-TB. We gave them the treatment and God help. That was basically, and you could feel the pressure and the stress. So we, we said, okay, if that's in China, it's probably so happening everywhere. So we started from late February, actually, uh, more of a qualitative uh, survey and questions to the colleagues in the countries. Um, and uh, the only country that we have data that can give us, uh, uh, how to say, uh, more solidity because uh, uh, models, uh, we can discuss a lot about them. And the example that uh, Ruri gave uh, about the differences between the WHO estimates and the Imperial College, uh, you know, we looked at that as well. And, you know, in models, you, whatever you put inside, you get something out. But, but we have uh, India, who is the highest burden country for TB, who has is the only country, the highest burden, and the only one that has live data available for any of us right now on TB. As of, we, we can go now online and we can access up to yesterday how many people were diagnosed per gender, per age group, per district, even vulnerabilities. It's incredible what they have. The only ones though. But when we look at that, and we don't look once, you know, we observed a drop of 70% in the diagnosis. 70%. So then that's how we said, listen, it's for sure not just India. Then we spoke with Indonesia and they said, oh yes, at least 60%. Then we spoke, uh, you know, so in Europe, in some of the European countries and they were all like, yes, of course uh, there is a drop. So we, we, we had this study happening. And what we looked at, and this is what drives me nuts at least, uh, is the fact that we didn't look at the impact that the coronavirus had on TB, by people with TB, because we don't have data. We, we assume and we know, we saw we have data from China and there are a few things coming up now uh, which are showing that when you have uh, TB uh, and you get coronavirus, obviously the prognostic is much worse. Also, if you are infected with TB, it seems that you get coronavirus, your activation as a TB active is happening. So anyway, uh, but we didn't look at that because there was not enough, uh, but we looked at this, this collateral damages, okay? Like the mitigation impact uh, effect is uh, having on uh, services and everything. And what we observed indeed is what, what you know very well. And it's a, you know, it's a combination of factors, not only as I heard that is happening, for example, in Ireland is happening, I am Romanian in my own country, that people are basically afraid to go out, but also they don't have means, they cannot, they don't have transportation, they don't have how to reach that, but also because TB Doctors that are dealing with TB deal with the lungs. So a lot of them are in the front line for COVID. The TB hospitals, especially the MDR TB hospitals are the worlds are pretty well designed or well designed for infection control. So the hospital and the beds and the doctors and the nurses are not necessarily very keen to see new people with TB. So the numbers that we got are really showing not only additional uh, 6.3 million people with TB uh, getting sick and 1.4 million people dying, but also we see a rollback in all the things that we tried to achieve to a level of an epidemic that was in 2015. And what scares me even more is if you look at the study and uh, we, I can send the link, but uh, it was actually, it had an, an amazing coverage, uh, is the fact that for each month of lockdown, there is an impact. And for each month of recovery, there is an impact. So we are, we spoke today uh, morning with uh, colleagues from Imperial because we need to relook really at some of this because as you see, actually some things are extended and high burden countries such as India, Indonesia, Bangladesh are now coming up with some big numbers. Africa, as you rightly said, um, seems uh, to be in lockdown and heavily impacted uh, South Africa, it breaks my heart. I think more by the lockdown than by the COVID. So, um, the study, I think you will, you will ask me some follow-up question, but I wanted to say that it was a very cold shower for us. We, are, we modeled uh, in that study, India, Kenya, and Ukraine to get three different health systems because it's different how India functions. Ukraine has a lot of MDR-TB, Kenya has a lot of TBHIV. We are doing South Africa, Philippines, and Bangladesh now. 
and um, we will uh, we will go ahead in refreshing a bit what happens for the extended lockdowns that we see actually. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lutika. I wonder if you could say something about, um, you know, clearly you're talking about, you know, rolling back efforts to, to 2015, to where we were at in 2015. <coughs> what can countries actually do to, to mitigate these effects so that it doesn't have such a great impact on the, on, on, on the TB response? So you see is uh, very much uh, linked to uh, what David said. Uh, the biggest mistake was, I think, uh, under the, uh, so it was a combination of the lack of the uh, protective uh, equipment. You know, you, you basically send the health workers with bare hands and nothing else. Uh, so you combine that with a, with a fear factor in which I think we had a reaction of a, a group of chickens scared by the wolf coming in and just uh, forgetting and, you know, the chicken running and die going in a cliff, you know, over a cliff just because they didn't look around. You know, uh, there is a thing uh, in airlines, uh, the pilots, uh, they, when they are, um, there is a, you know, they are asked to do a test uh, and uh, for a falling, uh, you know, for a crash of a plane, and 80% uh, uh, of them are forgetting about the environment in which they can have some things. They just fall looking at the crash. So that's what happens. So what should be is now that in a way there is a breathing space. I think most of countries are able to get this protective equipment and to be a bit in a better place for that these services must be open and if not uh, not for everything but at least the diagnosis you see in tb we have this snowball effect it's not that you have one person that is sick it infects others and it doesn't infect at workplace because a lot of people are not there but it infects the entourage or the family that the person stays with so diagnosis must be open and then for treatment or what a lot of countries try to do and i heard the lady from mozambique as well and we actually work with mozambique to see what they can do is giving treatment at home for TB for two, three months. And, and you know, in a way, God bless you, because the point is, is not enough to give the treatment. You need to be in touch with that person because you can create very easy drug resistance. So it's very, in a way, it's very simple. You need to find your local solution to ensure that people that have other diseases are getting access to their diagnosis and treatment. And I think for me, it's a big crime. It happens in my own country. It happens in all Europe, leave aside other parts in which the essential, the health, basic health services are not available, uh, you know, even for dentists. I mean, people with broken legs were sent home to wait. Uh, believe it or not, it's uh, hallucinating how idiots we can be sometimes. So that's the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nadine, you're muted. Thank you, Dr. Lutika. I wonder if I could just ask you one last question, and that is, um, has there been or is, could there be any positive effect that COVID has had um, in terms of people understanding more about infectious disease, about TB? Um, and is there any way to kind of harness that to, to achieve some of the targets that you've set to achieve by 2030? Yeah, so I would say there are there are three things I would refer. One, one related to, in general, I think, uh, people understand much more about not only infection, but also airborne. You know, we, we spoke about uh, wearing masks and we spoke about washing hands and we spoke about checking your symptoms if you have a bit of fever and so on. Th this is the other drama that TB and COVID, the symptoms can be pretty similar. You know, you sweat at night, you feel not well, you have fever, you cough, a dry cough, you know, so it's very easy to... Uh, so. I think people hear uh, uh, more about it uh, from that point of view. Um, I think COVID will ride on some of the things that we did for TB because we do a lot of contact tracing. We have in many countries, even us as Stop TB, we funded uh, va vans that are going in the community to find people with TB. So it's very easy if you send a van here to do not just not TB only, but you can do also COVID. If it's properly equipped, it's much easier than having people moving around and so on. Uh, so I think COVID will uh, ride a lot on the TB part, but I think the world will hear, hopefully, more about this uh, airborne and infectious disease. I mean, you know, this discussion with COVID being airborne or not, we leave it there. But that's one positive thing. But I think overall, I think it brought the importance of health in the attention of all these political leaders. I think we all here, I assume, suffer from the same type of uh, overlook uh, especially me working in TB, nobody paid attention because if there is somebody in health, 
treatment is dermatology, cardiovascular, and surgery. TB, nobody gives a shit. But in general, epidemiologists, public health sector, infection control, all these areas that were always neglected, always left at the bottom of a budget uh, with a question mark, I think or I hope we learn something from it and becomes more visible. And to be honest, I hear that a lot of young people now want to become doctors, nurses, and not necessarily just the ones uh, putting Botox uh, in uh, left and right, but also doctors like us dealing more on the field. So I think it's a bad, uh, say, uh, publicity, not bad. It's a bad way to say COVID brings the publicity for hidden um, areas of work. And I just refer to us here, nurses and everybody else. There are others as well equally important. Mm, thank but, you. Uh, we need to be yeah. smart and learn from it. So, yeah. Well, thank you, and thank you for being so frank and and for painting such a um, such a clear picture, and also leaving us with um, I'm I'm left very much with the chicken and the wolf scenario as well. So thank you for that. And um, I hope to circle back around. And um, but in the meantime, I'd like to go over to Trish if I can. Um, and Trish, you have been um, as they say in the trenches in in Tanzania. You've been on the ward with uh, children who are coming in with cancer. And um, can you tell us a little bit about what your experience has been, your your experience with their lives matter, and with your work? Um, on the wards in, in Mohambili. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Nadine. So just to paint a, a picture just very briefly of what, what we do kind of in normal times when before COVID hit is um, uh, the hospital that I'm based in, Mohambili National Hospital, is the largest um, government hospital in the country and Their Lives Matter and uh, Tumayla Maisha, which is what we call it um, in Tanzania, the charity, um, combined uh, provide services free of charge to children mm -hmm. with cancer who, who, who make it to Mohambili Hospital. We also, over the last 13 years, have created an outreach of centres across the country. Um, so these are centres that are, we don't have staff in them, they are government hospitals or faith-based hospitals, and they provide uh, care for children with cancer under our direction. So we give them the chemotherapy for free and we come on a call with them once a week um, to try and make sure that every child who has active treatment is discussed by a specialist, even if there's no specialist on that site. So that's the service that we have been maintaining and building in the last number of years. Um, and it's what we wanted to grow over the coming years as well, until we had a situation where no child was more than four hours journey from a site that knew what to do. So we're not there yet, but that was what we were doing. So then, um, and then just the, the Irish link, obviously I'm Irish and um, the, we have a partnership through Esther. Um, I was looking back uh, before this call just to see, and I think it was 2014. It might've started in 2013, the discussions, but I think we signed it in 2014. So we have a long, a long um, relationship with Esther and with CHI specifically, Crumlin Temple Street, and actually more broadly across um, the Irish Health Service recently have been helping us many, many hospitals. So um, that has been really wonderful and has saved us a lot during this crisis. So we realized as, um, being Irish and keeping my eye on what was going on in Ireland, we realized probably early on the ward what was what we were facing. Um, because I think in Tanzania we were at least six weeks behind what was happening in Ireland. So we made the uh, we made the decision as as a group, and this was the doctors, the nurses, and all the staff around around the care of the children, um, which was both government staff and um, charity staff. We made the decision to do basically what was happening in Ireland in terms of protecting uh, the service, the children, the parents and the staff early um, in terms of um, making the ward COVID as safe as possible as we could. So before we started seeing cases in the community, we had um, locked down the ward. So we had very few visitors allowed and we had um, started people wearing masks because I think it takes several weeks before people can learn how to wear masks properly. We made, I believe, an error in that we only put masks on the staff initially and only on, on the children or the parents if they were symptomatic. Um, and as a result, we had a very large outbreak on the ward. Um, we had um, to modify the, the, the ward space itself. And we also obviously had to teach people, you know, everyone thinks they know how to wash their hands and use hand sanitizer, but that was something I think that has really helped us. In terms of PPE, we decided that we couldn't afford to use these once only throwaway 
PPE options. And so we have um, mobilized the entire community of Dar es Salaam to make masks for us, to make gowns for us. Um, and they have responded. We've had, uh, I think, a thousand masks made for us and over a hundred gowns, which we, we put in then donated bleach and then we uh, put into um, washing machines every evening and and recirculate those and that I think has been a model that has been sustainable and something we've been able to use um, you were asking or you were mentioning I think David mentioned it in terms of was was there anything positive and you know or what was one of the priorities and for me one of the priorities is as he said to make the team feel safe and make the team feel that we we valued them and we wanted to do everything to protect them. And in that way, the, the other things we did was we took them all off public transport and got them solutions to come in in much smaller numbers. We put them into teams so that the um, the exposure that one team would have would be different from a second team's exposure in case there was, as there was, it turned out, an outbreak on the ward. And we also provided food for the staff. And as I say, these things are there, there's money involved, but like providing rice and beans for people every day is not a massive expense. And the goodwill that this has created on the, I have to say the one amazing thing that I have experienced every day that I've gone to work on the ward is the, the incredible spirit on the ward and how, how dedicated, motivated, brave, and also like looking after each other. If, if someone is doing, you know, about to walk into a room without an apron on or something, someone will pull them back. And, and, you know, everybody is looking after each other. And, you know, asking people to do more than is their job description has become the norm. And I've never heard anyone complain. I've never heard anyone um, say that, you know, it's not their job description or I was supposed to be off an hour ago. Genuinely, that possibly is the most positive thing that has happened. N not that we didn't have a lovely team before, but just it's really grown that the sense of team. And I, I think that's a real testament to, to the staff on, on the ward. Mm -hmm. um, Trish, what would you what would you say, Trish? I mean, you're dealing with on the ward, you have children who are, are coming into you and some of them are very, very sick. What have you seen? You had an outbreak on the ward. How has COVID affected their treatment, the 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 prioritization of the services that they need um anything around that what's your what's your experience yeah so so in numbers first of all um our numbers are down so that's definitely true so we uh, for the first three months of the year we saw an increase of about 10 percent a month of children coming in from the previous years um and then for the last two months we've seen a 25 percent decrease in the two months and we would predict that it should have been increased every month because every year we see, you know, another 50 to 100 children because we're nowhere near at capacity of seeing every child we would predict. So every year we would expect to see, you know, 10 or 15 percent more. So we were on track for that and now we're not. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the, the outbreak, the, the we had access to testing under strict criteria. There's one lab in the country that can test. Um, and so we had a number of children and a number of parents who fitted those criteria and we were able to test for them. Um, there was, there is no, um, no testing for contact tracing. Um, and so that made um, it very difficult. Uh, and we had to really think about how do we manage a ward where the children live for some of them up to a year how do we manage a ward space where we know that there's been an outbreak? We had 18 of the 20 tests that we did were positive. So we know that you could double that figure, if not more, if you think of 50% of people with silent disease. And of course, in and of itself, that's not a risk to them. But for me, the priority is, um, although people have said, you know, this doesn't really affect children and that the priority is maintaining, if, if we lose our staff, we lose the service because we don't have a deep pool of staff. And so maintaining the, 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 the protection for the, the staff was really important. So what we decided to do was rather than continuing testing people who are symptomatic and then only picking up a fraction of who was actually positive, we decided not to test people unless they were very, very symptomatic and, you know, there was reasons why the hospital would insist we test. Um, but, you know, someone with very mild symptoms, we just decided mm -hmm. the entire ward was COVID positive. And we we approached every child and every parent as if they had COVID. Um, we weren't able to do the whole bodysuit thing. But one of the lessons that I think that has come out of this is we because we started the hand washing and the and the face masking and everybody having hand sanitizer on their person at all times before probably it was absolutely needed. 
everybody had learned how to use it and do it properly by the time it was needed. So I do think the lag time of six weeks made a difference. We haven't had any staff member who's become, uh, there's a couple of people who've gone out with flu-like symptoms for a couple of days, but nobody has gone down unwell. Um, and so I wonder if with careful hand hygiene, don't touch your face, you know what, the message is that everybody's saying, that actually, but they're, but they're very important. You can't ignore them because people do get sick and die without them. But if you implement those things, and as I said, we had masks, we had gowns, we had those things. If you implement those across the board, you know, we have been able to maintain our service and our staff levels um, uh, for, for the children. Um, and so I think that's kind of an important lesson. The fear has gone down on our ward. Uh, I personally was very afraid at the beginning mm. um, you know, because the resources for ICU care are there, but they are very stretched very quickly. And so if you got sick, you were very likely to die of this. And, and that's not what we've seen in terms of staffing. I'm not saying I'm not commenting on out in the community and what's going on in the wider, uh, the wider issue of Tanzania. I'm mm -hmm. saying with the pr correct PPE and the correct um, um, methods of you know, hygiene and, and sanitation that you can actually protect staff mm -hmm. quite well. Trish, thank you so much. You're so it's so so inspirational and it's so important for us to understand, you know, how how it actually is working on the ground. And you've done such a great a job to paint a picture for us and um, to help us understand that. So thank you so much. I think I'll just come around to each panelist and maybe I'll start with yourself, Trish, as we're there. Just can you leave us with even just one sentence, what you would, you know, uh, some of the, the wisdom, a word of wisdom for all of us um, in terms of what we should be doing or thinking about as we move along. Just as short as yeah. you can. Yeah, I, I think that the, the key is that uh, cancer care is extremely important, as is TB care, uh, uh, even more so in, in, in our setting. But we have to figure out, we can't avoid the issue of COVID. So we, and we have to protect the staff. So if we've no access to testing, we have to understand not to protect the PPE, but find novel solutions that the PPE can be reused safely and everyone has access to what they need. Um, and in that way, you can maintain a service. Thank you, Trish. Really clear and um, taken on board. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Luchika, I don't know if you're if you're if you're able to see us there. If you have one last word for us, just a sentence for us, just to leave us with some of your wisdom, that would be wonderful. Um, my uh, word will be uh, we need to be uh, smart, flexible and innovative because and uh, also not one size suits all. Uh, trying to put uh, the same rules for everyone everywhere led us where we are here. Uh, we need to adjust and to be innovative to what we face in our environment, flexible to change very quickly with all this mess that is very rigid in general. And uh, we need uh, to uh, be very uh, adaptive because the situations will continue to change and we will not be able to go back to normal life too soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Luchika. Uh, wonderful. David, just a last word from you, as short as you can. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think I appreciate it from today, the value of reciprocal learning and we need to keep learning from each other. So let's keep doing that. And, to sell, and finally, to uh, to take the positives out of this challenge that we're in and see how we can build back better and address some of the fundamental challenges in our health systems that we've been struggling with for years and create a more equitable health system for all. Mm, thank you for your passion, David, for this issue. Uh, and Rory, just a very last word, as quick as you can, and we need to close out. Thank you. I was also struck by Georgina Caswell's um, contribution, and uh, I've just been looking up... Uh, WHO Afro on, on, on the website. And uh, I just posted something there. Uh, I, I wonder is, is, is WHO really grasping uh, this nettle? And, and I think uh, should African countries start challenging this importation of the European North American model? Uh, I think, you know, challenging the lockdowns and it's not enough as, as the WHO Afro head there just to refer to routine healthcare services. Lockdowns have impacted hugely on those services, on people's ability to access them and on their ability to live. And, and should we be looking, should Africa be looking at a, a model of moving forward, which acknowledges that COVID-19 is not as serious as, as these other 
endemic problems are and, and, and start charting its own way. Uh, otherwise, it's really going to be set back years in terms of th these uh, HIV, TB, mother and child health, and above all, nutrition and, and malnutrition. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. It is a privilege to sit with all of you and to um, to learn from you. And Hala, maybe just over to you to close us out. And thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Nadine. And thank you to all the speakers for all those insightful uh, information. And uh, also thank you to the HSC for collaborating with us and co-hosting this webinar. And next week's webinar will be about the positive power of communities in the response yeah. to COVID-19. So if you have any questions, please, please send them in advance. And this webinar will be available. The recording of it will be available on our website. And uh, thank you, everyone. And see you next week. Stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.